to a new edition of the Garrity Talks. I'm Lucia Ongai, the co-founder of Garrity, the award that brings together a jury to select the best in advertising from a powerful perspective. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for our weekly episodes where we chat with some of the marketing and creative industries through change makers. Today, we're having a chat with the winners of the Otpop sixth annual Women's Film Challenge. In honor of International Women's Day, Otpop, which is a social impact video platform connecting creators and filmmakers, businesses, and audiences globally, invited female and non-binary filmmakers from around the world to submit their short fiction or non-fiction films to celebrate through them women's achievement, raise awareness about discrimination, and take action to drive gender parity. The winners of this edition were Yasha Ka. She got the first place with her film, Documentacion. Hi, Yasha. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Uh, Rada Meta, honorable mention with her film, Being Gina. Hi, Rada, Hi. thanks for so joining nice us. nice to meet you all. <laughs> And Nadesh Ta, who also had a honorable mention with her film, Paris Blues. Hi, Hi. nice to meet you. <laughs> so welcome, uh, congratulations to all of you. Thank you for joining us today. So let's start by introducing yourselves. Can you tell me more about where you come from, uh, what you do, and a little bit about your work? Yasha, would you like to start? Sure. My name is Yasha. Uh, I live in Brooklyn, New York. I'm from Philadelphia and I am a film director and work in documentary, commercial narrative and narrative. Um, and this film, Document Documentation, um, is a documentary about Marianne Hala Serrano, who is an amazing photographer from Venezuela who now lives in the States. Um, and yeah, I'm super excited to be here and talk more about our work. <laughs> Rada, would you like to go on? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Rada Mehta. Um, so I am a, uh, a writer director. I had been doing documentaries for the past decade, and then I've recently just earned my MFA in film, uh, for directing at American Film Institute. Um, I'm based here in Los Angeles, and uh, my film, Being Gina, is about um, this lady named Gina Wassenmiller, who is a parent ally. She had recovered um, from substance abuse, and she now serves as inspiration for many parents who um, are at the risk of having their children separated at birth. And so she helps mothers on their road to recovery in order to be able to keep their families united. Um, so yeah, so I'm very excited to talk about this project and just about filmmaking in general, um, especially when it comes to empowering women uh, and being able to tell their stories in the best of light. Nadesh? Hi, my name is Nadesh Pata. Um, I'm an actress, writer, dancer, producer, filmmaker. So basically a multifaceted artist. And Paris Blues in Harlem is a loosely based story about this, uh, Samuel Hoggers, who owns a Paris Blues jazz bar in Harlem. And he's a local Harlem hero who established the jazz bar since 1969 on November 15th. And it has seen many different phases and changes of Harlem from the uh, drug era to now the current um, shift and changes with the gentrification process that is happening in Harlem. So he is like a living history with this establishment called Paris Blues. So I did a loosely based story about a young woman wanting to sell her father's jazz club. So she values um, money and he values um, the community. So that's basically how I um, came about as Paris Blues is because the actual owner, Samuel Hargis, unfortunately transitioned during the pandemic and it's still standing to this day, but I was extremely um, proud that I was able to write a story about Paris Blues in Harlem, where he's the glue between the old Harlem and the new Harlem. And what were your expectations when entering the challenge? What did you want to achieve? I can begin. For me, um, the expectation is to continue to plug as much visibility as possible to 
to give exposure to this local Harlem hero who is the bridge between the old and the new Harlem. And wherever I can continue to expand on getting more eyes on it in, in the, globally, it's, it's really, that was one of my goals in applying for this contest. Yeah, I would say same here. Um, this is a project that I had um, done with Institute for Family uh, a long while ago. And it's really been amazing the journey that the film itself has taken. It serves as an opener for a lot of um, conferences when it comes to dealing with foster care, as well as um, you know how we can develop partnerships with uh, CPS and being able to just keep families united. And I, I just wanna keep gaining visibility. I feel like um, with this story, it's a little bit um, timeless. And, and I feel that the challenge still remains in order to uh, be able to help moms who you know, come from um, very unprivileged backgrounds and uh, underrepresented backgrounds and they, need, they just need our help. They need, um, they need that nurturing care from society uh, to be able to overcome whatever circumstances that they're they've been given and um and I feel that when mothers I'm a mother myself I have two little kids and I just feel very strongly that when mothers are united with their kids with the best of care um it's it really becomes the best outcome for the kids in their lives as well and you don't have to continue passing that trauma uh, from generation to generation so yeah so I, I what I appreciate about Oddpop is just allowing for that visibility for social change yeah, I, I would totally agree with both of those. I Any competition, film competition, and especially one that highlights women made films is just awesome as a way to get our films out there, especially in the documentary and narrative space. That is the biggest challenge is to try to get more eyes on your work. It's not like advertising where it's going to go up on every TV channel, you know, periodically all over media and it's not necessarily a money-making industry. Um, so this is just an incredibly awesome way to, for us to get our work out there. And um, I'm very grateful for that. So that's that's definitely also why I submitted to Odd Pop and this story um, about you know immigration from Venezuela to the US um, as a refugee to um, was also a story I'll, I, can get into it more later, but it's a story that we really wanted to share with people. Um, you know, people can see things in the news, but they don't necessarily know like the the more intimate side of the difficulties and struggles that come with that, and the beautiful sides as well of um, of that journey of a lot of young people coming from Venezuela. So, so yeah. Yeah, let's get into it right away. <laughs> so as uh -huh. I mentioned before, uh, Yasha, you had the first place with your film, Documentación. So tell us about how you came up with the idea and, and about the creative process. Yeah, so my very good friend, Gabriel Gavidia, is uh, also uh, came from Venezuela in his 20s. Um, and he and I would be talking, I, you know, just as friends, like learning more about his story of how he had to, you know, a lot of people left their older members of their family in Venezuela who are still there or other people, you know, to get the chance to come to the US isn't that common. So it means really restarting your life by yourself. And so he has a close community of people he knows um, from home that are over here in the States and Mari Angela is one of them. Um, and so we developed, we wanted to actually make a series about different um, people coming as young adults um from Venezuela especially to New York um this was the first supposed to be the first episode and then <laughs> as things go we haven't made more episodes but we still hope to um called Project V um and Maria Angela is just an incredible photographer and her her method of coping as well as creating art is self-portraiture through photography so it's an interesting really interesting way to come in from a filmmaking point of view of telling sharing a story um, and having a visual kind of transformation that she had captured that she she describes um, through her photos so that that was the goal and I, and on top of that in just the interview it came to light that she had a ton of footage that she had actually shot in Venezuela that was 
really the reason why she left Venezuela. There was um, actually documenting any of the unrest that was happening at, at that time is still happening is something that can get you in a lot of trouble. So her family felt she needed to get out. Um, and so we got a bunch of that footage. She was gracious enough to let me use in this documentary. And so that's featured as well. So it's a whole transformation and it's amazing when the format and the subject of a film actually coalesce that well um, to execute the whole sort of purpose of the telling that story. Good. And Rada, you had a honorable mention with being Gina. Yeah. So please tell yeah. us more about how you came up with the idea and the creative process. Yeah, so um, I had learned of an opportunity with Institute for Film to apply for a grant to make a documentary, and I hadn't quite had a, um, a specific topic in mind. Um, There's a, a few topics that I was kind of messing with. Um, but then while I was on that call, there was a lady that joined that call, and she was just like, I... Um, you know, I am not a filmmaker, but I would love for my, you know, I'd love for some light to be shed on the parent ally movement in the state of Washington. And I was just so drawn to her. And that was actually uh, Gina. And so um, when when she was on that call afterwards, I followed up with her right away. And I said, I would love to learn more about this story. Like, what is it that you're, you know, what is, tell me more about parent allies in general. And so as she shared more and more about the movement itself, um, I got to know more about her and her journey. And I was like, actually, this film needs to be about you and um, and how you overcame what you came, you know, what you've gone through. And so um, that's what led to, you know, me being able to connect with her. I think it was just kind of serendipity. Um, and then now the idea is that I would love to be able to feature, um, to incorporate her into a um, an episodic uh scripted um show and so we're working on developing that together um soon and so we're, you know i think that there there's a lot of um there's a lot of positive talk about what parents can do as they help one another um, as mm -hmm. opposed to government interfering and and i think that you know in the state of washington they had kind of been pioneers um in that and i feel like it needs to be nationwide and so we're hoping to raise awareness uh with that and so, um, yeah, so when she came to me as kind of serendipity, I was just so grateful. I was like, this is a story that I would love to be able to, to continue on the journey of. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. So you both look forward to continue a little bit with your stories. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. And Nadesh, you had a honorable mention too with your film, Paris Blues. Uh, mm -hmm. Please tell us a little bit more about the idea and the creative process. Okay, Paris Blues in Harlem. Um, the way I met Mr. Samuel Hargris is I was fundraising for my first short film and I was going around local communities to attain support. And he gave me $250 cash. He's very old school, right? <laughs> so he's been from Alabama. And so I would continuously stop by and let him know my progress and my process with the short film. But I became curious about him. And he was telling me about how he knows Rosa Park and he has Rosa's Park photo in at, at Paris Blues hanging there. He said, I did the Montgomery Walk. And it, he just got more and more interesting to me. And um, he stems from Alabama. He was in the military and then he went to Paris. So that's how he came up with the name Paris Blues because he loves the film Paris Blues that starred. Sidney Poitier and Diane Carroll. So the more he kept, the more I was engaging him and I said, you are an interesting person because he cooks seven days a week. Food is free for the community. You can stop at the bar if you're hungry. You don't have to buy a drink, just come on eat. There's free food from 6 p.m. to 1.30 a.m. And it's a local tourist attraction from especially a large population of Europeans actually come and stop by at Paris Blues. And I said, wow, I assume this place was just a shack because you see older <laughs> people just sitting there and to the community, we're just passing by. And I'm like, oh my God, there's so much wealth and history in this establishment where a lot of the historical places in Harlem are being lost through demolition 
and we're losing historical sites. And he was smart to purchase his property. He actually owns the building, uh, the jazz bar and the um, commercial, commercial space as well as the residential space. And it's worth well over 10, $20 million. He's received so many offers. And I said, I'm going to do a story about you. And, it, and it's going to tackle how do we build generational wealth? Because it's very smart. Because for many of the residents of Harlem, uh, the, the push has been economically. And I said, sometimes the properties or are passed on to the next generation and they don't know how to manage it. And it's just, we don't know how do we learn to build second, third, fourth ge generational wealth. And he was smart. And there our relationship grew, uh, went to many film festivals and I would, the ones that were local, I would take him with me so people can actually meet the actual Samuel Hargris, not the person who played him. And then um, he transitioned in 2020, never been sick. So that was a, a, a big blow to the community as well as his family, because it was unexpected and it was locked down. So we never properly got to celebrate or actually have a memorial celebration for him. It was online, Facebook Live, and it eliminated the older generation who are not tech savvy, mm -hmm. right? So, and he was very politically connected, known. And so the film continues to be requested because of the memory of him and the story resonates a lot with everyone. And uh, who are your mentors or people that inspired you or helped you with your projects? You talking um, about, oh, go ahead. Oh. Three of them. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, 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 I would, oh, sorry. Okay, yeah, you, go, gonna, you go, you go, you go. I'll just say, yeah, like, I mean, I feel like a, a big mentor of mine is actually the community of that, that I was filming. Um, one of the scenes, because uh, I have a longer version of the same film as well, that really dives into um, specific stories. But one of the scenes in both of our films was um, where we got to be in the women support group that Gina leads. And that's it's a safe space for all the different women to tell their stories on how they were able to overcome um, their circumstances to be able to stay united with their children. And some of these circumstances were so dire. Um, you know, you're talking about sexual assault. You're talking about um, just uh, all kinds of domestic abuse that really led them to be um, in a position where they couldn't defend themselves in any kind of way, legally or financially. And they really served as my mentors because just learning their stories, it helped me understand um, how much empathy needs to be created around uh, just women in general. I mean, we already understand that women are um, at a disadvantage in a lot of ways and specifically women of color. And, um, and so, yeah, I kind of looked at them for advice in general. And then um, Institute for Family was an incredible mentor as well because they they have such a deep understanding of um, how the foster care system works, how um, parent child separation works, and how and all the things that it takes to be able to unite um, them. And then the biggest uh, mentor was the specific legal clinic that um, Gina helped found, which is called um, First Clinic. And the stuff that they're doing pro bono um, and serving as advocates for these women that otherwise could never afford a lawyer to stand up for themselves, um, it's incredible. It's really incredible. And so they tell me all the different things that they have to go through um, just so that the, the, the mothers in need are heard. And it's just crazy the things that the things that they'd have to overcome just to be heard, to be able to s just ba stay united with their own baby that they give birth to. It, it, in a lot of circumstances, like within 24 hours of birth, their child is separated. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I really look to community as serving as my mentor specifically for this. And of course, there's several other films out there on social change that I look to as examples. Um, but I felt that the mentors were the actual participants that I found. Mm. Yasha? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, well, also, I wanted to say before I forget to say this, I watched both of your films this morning and they're both awesome. So, and just so, so um, 
poignant to watch. So I, I really enjoyed both of them. Um, uh, the mentor I was going to mention for this film, especially is Alma Harrell, um, and not mentor, like I have not met her, but I am a huge admirer of her. She's a yeah. huge inspiration as far as, especially with documentary and kind of hybrid narratives, looking at interesting ways, inventive ways to, to tell the story um, and avoid the kind of usual tropes, which sometimes makes sense. And I've made a lot of documentaries that, you know, very much follow those, but the more like I was able to find archival video for this and find different ways to use the medium that Mario Angelou uses, which is photography, um, it kind of brought something new to the film. And so Alma Harrell is just, her film Bombay Beach um, is this incredible documentary that uses dance and um, sort of verite footage in a way that's really almost like emotionally realistic rather than um, reality-based realistic. Um, it really helps get into the story and the person who, the person, the person sort of um, journey more than sometimes, you know, a sit down interview and just only relying on that can. Um, we did do a sit down interview still, but anyway, so you, you got to get that as well. Um, but yeah, Alma Harrell and, uh, yeah, I guess artists of all type, because Maria Angela was an inspiration for this film. She is the subject and she's a photographer. And I feel there's a lot to learn from other mediums as well. Mm -hmm. Now this? Mm -hmm. I share the same sentiments with the ladies. Um, I would say Samuel Hargris himself, you know, the importance of community. Uh, the importance of ownership, the importance of giving back. He taught me so much, so much. And um, the actual staff that um, some of them has been working with him since 1969. Um, I've learned by so much through, through the engagement with them, um, the commitment that they had with each other and the long-term relationship. Sam's best friend. Now we talk at least once a month. He lives now in Atlanta. He moved from Harlem to Atlanta. And I'm learning much more about Sam than when Sam was alive. So his mentorship is extremely essential and important for me as I continue to develop um, in other mediums to continue to carry his story along and yeah, I would have to say the staff, Sam himself, um, that community have served such a great mentorship for me and the importance of what that village looks like and how supportive they are to each other and, and running a business. <laughs> so, wow, it's unheard of to be with someone for that long. Some of some of his staff members have been with him for that long and how committed he was to the community where I would see he would hire somebody if they got off drugs. You know, if they went back on drugs, he'd lay them off. So the purpose was to make sure that um, people kept themselves as clean as possible. He's there to help you, whether it was financially, whether it was emotionally, mentally. And I always wonder who was there for him. You know, so I always made sure that I was there just to, how are you, Mr. Sam? I would stop by all the time. So I would say he was my biggest mentor in this process of making the film. Hmm. And let's talk about, a little bit about your passion for filmmaking. So did you always know you wanted to work in filmmaking or production or in the creative industry? So how did you get here? Brad, I see you want to talk. <laughs> Go yeah. ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I had been doing uh, documentary filmmaking as a side hustle for the past decade, right? And so then uh, it was during the pandemic that I um, decided to take uh, filmmaking much more seriously as a career, um, as a potential career. And so um, I had applied to American Film Institute, um, not, you know, not knowing or thinking uh, I had a chance of getting in. 
but I was very grateful that when I did get um, accepted, I it was the best decision of my life. And what we learned there, it's it's a very intense conservatory where you make short film after short film and uh, um, very hands-on experience. And so we learned narrative filmmaking there. And so now, now that I just finished the program uh, and I will have an MFA in film, I feel like I have a very strong foundation to be able to take this further where I will always continue my love for documentaries, but now understanding um, what it takes to make a narrative and fictional film, it opens so many more possibilities where I can bring true, true stories to life without necessarily um, uh, compromising certain circumstances where confidentiality is very key. So, um, so in the case of Parent Ally, uh, a lot of the women that are undergoing these court cases to be able to stay united with their children, um, they necessarily wouldn't want to be able to show themselves on, on camera for confidentiality purposes because of what it is that they're going through, but they would be more than happy to be able to share their stories. Um, and we can fictionalize certain versions of it so that it doesn't necessarily um, come back to them. And I just love that because there's so many times in documentaries where you know, uh, we have to make sure as as documentary filmmakers that you keep it as authentic and real as possible and you don't tinker with what it is that they're saying. But there'd be moments where I was like, oh, I wish that this person said this because then it can allow for like a dramatic arc and you just can't do that, right? So, and then you have to figure it out in editing and post. Whereas in fictional filmmaker, you can, you know, in fictional filmmaking, you can actually like create a specific story based on all the content mm -hmm. knowledge and research that you have. And then when you go into your shoot, then you can actually be able to craft the story that you really want. And then of course in post, it becomes a lot further along uh, where you're not have to re, you're not necessarily redefining the story. You're trying to keep continuing to create it the best version possible. So um, so I feel like I've got the best of both worlds in that sense. And um, I'm just very excited that now I can with the solid foundation, be able to continue filmmaking as an actual uh, career. That's mm -hmm. so cool. Um, I love that. I I decided I would get into film or I would be a film director when I was 19. And during a sort of vision that I had without sounding too much like woo woo, but uh, it was a, just really a moment. I was like listening to music. Music was always my thing. Not that I can make it, but I, that I loved it. And just visualizing what I wanted to go along with that music and I was like oh that's it that's what all these things that I love will come together and I'm gonna work in film and that's what I should put all my energy into and that's what I did a lot of internships when I was not in school and taking film classes where I could in school and then I actually started more in the editing track I was an editor for a long time so it's funny that you say that Radha about um editing and documentary being so important. I mean, I edited this documentary. I still edit a lot of my more passion projects. Um, and it is, especially with documentary, like half of the creative side of the whole thing, right? Um, so yeah, so I really learned as much as I could through the years and um, internships, jobs. I worked in magazines for a long time. Um, I was able to do a program at a film school in London which was with my college, had this awesome kind of scholarship program to send us over there. And it was learned so much there. Oh no, are my AirPods still on? <laughs> <laughs> okay, this one's working. Um, and yeah, I've done so many jobs. It's hard to figure out where to, what to say has happened because it's been a long 10 years, but um, yeah, editing and now I'm directing mainly. So started in documentary and now I'm doing more and more narrative as well. Well, for me, I was more in front of the scenes instead of behind the scenes. Um, so my first artistic discipline started off with dance. I'm trained in ballet and modern. And then um, went to school for psychology, got a master's in psychology and continued dance and then went the acting route a lot of theater. And I think once I became a mom, the reality of trying to balance what I do as an actress on stage, um, didn't think it was 
feasible financially as well as energetically try to do stage and manage one child at a time I'm a mother of three and so my I decided to write and from writing then I fell into directing because I also saw myself visualizing how I like to see this directed and the rest is history. I did my short film in 2015 after my third child, and I wanted to more take the lead in my career as an actress and actually create roles that I like to see myself in and feel proud for and not feel uh, not feel in control because I need this role, but I don't necessarily like it because it's not really showing the diversity of who I am as a Black woman and the diversity that we bring into what our stories are, because it's usually linear and it's not really showing the diversity of who we are, especially culturally. And so I started to create these roles that I identify with in my um, growing up with parents from the Caribbean, being born here. So I, I've seen many characters that I'm not seeing on screen. So I decided to write these characters and shape them. And this is how I filmmaking came into my lap because I would never imagine I would do that. I thought I would just, would just act. That's it. But then I started realizing I'm actually having fun with it because I'm creating what I'm not seeing. Hmm. And where do you think the industry is heading towards the film industry in general? I think in the past, over time, we've seen a lot of artists be devalued in terms of any type of art that they create. Um, and with the, you know, with the with the advance of AI technologies, there, there's definitely a fear around what they can do. They can essentially displace us. But I don't think that they can displace human empathy. I don't think that mm. they truly understand what it takes to be um, empathetic towards one another. And I think that that's what we need to keep fighting for. And that's what we need to keep representing in the works that we provide. Um, there's no technology that can ever create such a such a circumstance like that or such a feeling and emotion like that. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you because I am stepping into this new immersive technology for the purpose of the Paris Blues and Harlem project. And it, you know, empathy, it's, 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 you can't replace it, but learning to use these tools to collaborate helps um, you move efficiently and operationally, especially when we are a small business, a me, five, me business. I find that the AI tools are definitely something that can help you be more efficient and move in speed and pace in terms of deliverables, where I feel AI will will have a place, but I think definitely the strike is does have the strike is necessary so that we are making sure that humans um, are compensated for the work that they do and that an AI generated work cannot is not the standard for considering um, for replacing human beings. Yeah. Yeah, I I'm definitely uh on a slightly different note like but similar in mood, very optimistic for the for the yeah. industry and I feel like I recently had an interview where they asked if you could work in any film era what would it be? And I was like, why would I ever go back in time in this industry? <laughs> like this is the only time that I would have the, the easiest or most possible time for me to actually have creative power in this industry. And hopefully it's just going to be more and more on the up as far as women and underrepresented directors and writers, especially directors and directors of photography. Um, you know, I, I know Garrity is, you know, that's one of the main things with Garrity. It's like, especially in advertising, what are women directors are one percent of the people who are getting the biggest paychecks and the <laughs> the visuals that see the most eyes I mean that shouldn't just be men so mm -hmm. and I think people are more and more aware of that um that that perspective is not the only perspective and 
there's so much more that the rest of us can give. So, um, so I'm really excited for the future. I hope things like this challenge and like Garrity keep doing the work that you guys are doing because it really, it's exciting for us. And yeah, I have a lot more I want to make too. I'm sure everyone mm. here does. Mm. Yeah, that's my last question to wrap up. What projects would you like to work for in the future? Yeah, so I'm actually in the process of um, developing a ultra low budget feature. Um, and my hope is to be able to shoot that um, at the top of next year. Um, I had just finished my MFA thesis film, and that's going to be now out in the world in whatever way the world takes it, um, you know, hopefully with some successes at film festivals and, um, and things like that. But I'm already kind of moving on mentally onto this next project, and I love feature films so much. So I'll be continuing to develop that, and my hope is to be able to secure um, you know, financiers and just producing partners to be able to help bring uh, a very tender story to life about a brother-sister relationship within my South Asian diaspora um, and overcoming family expectations and being able to um, come to oneself and, you know, be able to find ourselves through this process. Because within my family in general, there's a lot of um, pressure uh, to be able to succeed and to be, you know, a certain thing outside of arts, whereas my, even though I have fulfilled all my family obligations as an engineer, um, as, which is one of my, you know, one of my uh, degrees, I feel like I've always been drawn to arts. And I find that a lot of South Asians within my, um, you know, within my circle are just very drawn to the arts. And I think that we have a lot of value to offer, uh, whether it be in music, filmmaking, or painting. And, um, and I want to be able to like lift that. And this story is very much around, uh, you know, around that. And I just want to be able to make, I just want to be able to make work and be hired for, uh, for work as well, you know, when it comes to directing and writing. So. <laughs> um, for me, I am in development for a historical figure um, whose history is oblivious. And um, so it's a development for a biopic television series, as well as a short film. So that is the other project that I'm currently working and developing. And as they say, it's once in development, then doing the outreach to get finance to mm -hmm. shoot. Awesome. Yes, Um. I finally can kind of say what this is. It's, I've been in, in development for like six years plus on a series, um, a comedic or drama drama comedy series about women in stand up in New York. Um, it's scripted. It's called Girls Aren't Funny. Um, I, it's, I'm collaborating with Brick TV, who is also actually my production company arm for. Doc for this documentary that is in this competition about Mari Angela. Um, so we shot the pilot last summer and now we are finally about to release it. And I'm very, very excited. Stand up is another passion of mine. Um, and also just an incredible storytelling vehicle for, you know, obviously what I'm most interested in based on Mari Angela as well, but like young adults finding their voice, um, especially in New York um, and figuring out who they are. And this, this series is about girls doing that through stand-up. Um, and the first episode stars Amama Sarder, who her story is incredible based on real life um, experiences as a stand-up and being Muslim and Pakistani and her family, you know, the struggles of, the family not really knowing and the double life that comes with that. So we're super excited to be releasing that. Girls aren't funny. We have our own Instagram. Check it out. Um, and other than that, directing more commercials. I I really want to get uh, more and more into that world again because of the incredible creative freedom and visibility you get in that field. Um, and yeah, that's what's on the horizon. Great. So thank you so much for sharing all this uh, with us and uh, all the best of luck with all your future projects. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, you know, I wanted to thank, thank you. you.
um, for what Garrity does. I really appreciate that because, you know, women are perhaps the biggest consumers when it comes to commercials or any type of film consumption. So um, it's really good what you're doing and, and just keep keep doing it, please. <laughs> keep raising awareness around that. <laughs> and you too, looking forward to many more projects and short films and documentaries to come from all yeah. of you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>